Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of VMware's Partnership Perspectives. I'm Kathleen Tandy, Vice President of Global Partner and Alliances Marketing at VMware, and I'm pleased to bring you the stories and trends from VMware industry analysts, partners, and executives. Today, I'm joined by Gavin Jolliffe, founder and CEO of Extrovert, a UK-based cloud consulting and managed services firm serving global customers across 36 countries. In his role, Gavin leads the Extrovert team in their mission to deliver winning outcomes and make digital transformation a reality for their customers. During our conversation, we discuss the industry and customer trends that led Gavin to first establish Extrovert, the four core principles that guided the company through the unexpected challenges of the past couple of years, and how Extrovert's constant desire to step into the unknown with a customer-first mindset is a strategic advantage for its clients. Enjoy the full conversation now. Gavin, welcome to Partnership Perspectives. It is just really great to have you join us today. Yeah, brilliant to be here. Thanks for having us, Kathleen. So, Gavin, you are the founder and CEO of Extrovert, which is a global cloud consulting and managed services firm. I know that what Extrovert does, because we've had the opportunity to work with you over the years, you've gained valuable insights from helping thousands of organizations modernize their IT departments, their IT infrastructures, and helping to transform their business. So really looking forward to talking with you today about some of the insights that you've gathered from all of those interactions. But let's start with Extrovert the company that you started. Can you start by telling our listeners a little about what Extrovert does, the markets and industries you serve, and how you've worked with VMware over the years? So you're right. We're a cloud consulting and managed services business. We're very much customer outcome driven, and and that's across the entire life cycle. And the first question I normally get is, well, what does that mean? We kind of break it down. We help customers navigate complex change in a multi-cloud world on the understanding really that organizations needs today exist across a life cycle, not just at the point of change or transformation. So we understand there are always risks and gaps in businesses. So what we focus on is, is laying the pathway to successful change, rolling up our sleeves and delivering that change, driving the anticipated business benefit after change is made. Our customers, they're frequently FTSE 250, Fortune 500 customers from a few thousand to a few hundred thousand seats. And you're right, today we work across 36 countries from our UK base. We've, we work across all industry verticals, but we've got a bit of a strong heritage in, in finance and public sector as a kind of key base. VMware, well, yeah, as you say, in terms of a partnership, we, we've got a really strong ongoing 14-year relationship now and counting. We're really proud to be one of the most accredited VMware advanced services in the UK, and we're a principal partner holding all of the the VMware master services competencies, which we actually find is a really great independent way of us to be able to show capability and experience and and helping transform and support customers across their life cycle. I think the way that we've worked with VMware and the the wider markets enabled us to, to remain a bit of a Switzerland. We work equally well with customers, VMware, broader cloud ecosystem alliance partners, and channel partners equally. So we're able to reach customers and their challenges through these sort of many routes to market. So you talked about working with customers at the point of change. I'm curious as in what's happening in the market today, change doesn't stop. So I'm curious typically how long your relationships last. Do you see these engagements evolving and are these ongoing long-term relationships that you have with your customers How are you just seeing the rate of change impact how you are working with customers these days? I think if we look back to more simpler times, we were very much focused on the change. There were really compelling events to adopt private cloud and digital workspace technology changes, and these have evolved and evolved and evolved. So, you know, our remit was to understand the customer's problem, get in there, make the change and let them get on with it and and get those business gains. What we've seen, and, and certainly the, the last two years has really amplified, is that you know, certainty is a really valuable business commodity today, and that managing uncertainty has become a bit of a necessary norm. And we see that in global supply chains and remote workforces and security and compliance. So we've seen the demand from businesses to respond more effectively to that uncertainty, but also this is challenging the way that we and organizations approach both steady state and change which is why the relationship with the customer needs to be virtuous. It needs to be value-driven. It needs to enable them to achieve 
change in the midst of, of uncertainty and ongoing and forecasting is one of these things that's been foreshortened and foreshortened as we hit different challenges and new challenges on a sort of weekly monthly basis. I think going back to my simpler times concept, we've seen with the accelerating pace of technology development and the, the previously well understood IT roles and IT operating models have now become different models, cloud models and consumption models and adoption models. And these more simple roles have now become dozens of new roles. And this is outstripping what we see is, is our customers' ability to keep up. And we see this real conflict in the ability for IT to both run and change at the same time. So what we've done is double down on what we see as solving three fundamental problems. So the first one is, is really organizations that are unable to stabilize their current state. So we effectively enter and support a business at any point in their life cycle, not just when there's compelling change events, or help them solve challenges or prepare them to successfully transform or change. The second one is more about complexity of multi-cloud. We see that it's diverse. We see that it's complex. It's becoming even more so this challenge around what capabilities I need and adopt and sustain. So that whole challenge to transform into multi-cloud today is where we can really help. We understand the paths, the life cycle, the how to get from the A to the B and try and leave the customer in a place where they can either pick up the reins or they can continue to work with us and we can help sort of fill and support some of those gaps, which is the third one. So organizations, as we know, when you're adopting cloud, it's often underestimated in terms of the challenge of change and Making it sustainable from both a financial and an integrity point of view is really, really important. So when program partners typically used to leave a partner, what we're seeing is actually there's a much more extended operational gap than we've ever seen in the past. That leads to conflicting operating models, key person dependencies, operational challenges, unprepared response type. All that sort of stuff enables us to be able to hold the the customer's hand through into the new world, not just at the point of which everyone used to celebrate. We deployed. That's great. That's actually where the real work starts now. And is that more of the managed services portion of your business in terms of the ongoing, or is it in addition to the managed service aspect of your business? The great thing is, is that because we go to the customer where their challenge is today, that can be before change, during change, or, or after change. And the way that we've approached managed services is that maybe unlike sort of models that we've seen in the past, we need to give the customer choice, control, recognize that they are going to evolve. And maybe at that point of change, they may not have all those capabilities that they want to achieve, or they may not want to invest in those now or, or down the track. And so we need to be able to be tangible. We need them to be able to understand what capabilities we can support and actually partner with them. And that over time, we don't lock them in. We find that's a really high barrier to relationship building. We, we need trust. We need transparency. And actually, if, if a customer says to, to us today, hey, you guys, can you do the risk and compliance side today? But we want to pick that up in a year's time. That's perfect. We have a, a bolt on that customers can take. And really happy to, um, to to give it back to them and ensure that they're gaining the value from time that we're offering those sort of services. That's great. So managed services is a complement. It can start and stop at any time. Zeroing in on your points about customers wanting choice and control, which is very aligned, but in a different way to VMware's. As we look at our multi-cloud strategy, one of the two key value propositions we've also been talking about is giving customers choice and control. But Choices across all of the different clouds. Control is being able to have enterprise governance and control to be able to manage it in a way. So I think those are themes that we're seeing manifested in a variety of different ways with our customers together in a variety of different ways customers are looking for that. One of the trends that I've heard about from customers, from other partners over this ongoing COVID time that we're living in, as it's accelerated technology adoption and the complexity, which Gavin, you were just talking about, it is really challenging the need for talent, right? Companies just don't have as many people to navigate all that in the skill sets. I think a number of partners are challenged too. But are you seeing that as a driver for more demand for your managed services? I call it the great atomization where roles have now exploded and there's more choice and the cool and fun roles for the next generation to come up in different places. And we have to underline that the majority of enterprise workloads today are sitting in VMware environments and this isn't going to go away anytime soon. However, the abundance of technology and the ability to use that to deliver really powerful business outcomes has to be harnessed. The challenge that we found actually over the last three or four years is that the number of specialisms 
have increased. So there is no such thing as just plain automation or network security. There's you know sub roles and sub specialities, which you think if a customer has to invest in all of those roles, not necessarily have them all highly utilized. You've either got to have a whole bunch of superheroes, which are going to be phenomenally expensive and in high demand and, and not, not in the industry, or you've got to find that pool of capability where it is highly utilized, but you're drawing off that, which is more of a managed services as a service. That's where we feel we can play a really strong game. We want to be the best of breed in the market, provide that breadth of capability. So it's two calls to the expert as opposed to maybe navigating a support chain. So we effectively see ourselves as being able to reduce cost, be more agile to the customers compared to what they may have in front of them today as a choice. And this problem isn't going to go away anytime soon. We're talking about fundamental generational change that will be with us for a little while, I suspect. Yeah, I think it speaks to the comments about the complexity that we're seeing as you talk about the specializations. It's just driving more and more complexity as more and more companies are really looking to technology to be that business transformation driver to deliver those outcomes that you were talking about. So I think Extrovert has a very healthy future in store as many of the other very strong VMware partners because of just the need that's growing. And I want to shift and and now talk a little bit about some of the drivers of those needs and see what you're seeing. So as I talk to other partners and customers, the events that we've all lived through over now, almost the last two years, have just skyrocketed the acceleration of adoption, the use of technology in numerous different ways. The initial was get our remote workers at home, figure out how we have our apps to be able to help do transaction. We've now kind of entered the more mature phase of this living in this pandemic world. What are you seeing as maybe the top three drivers that are influencing the asks and the needs that your customers are bringing to you? Number one is uncertainty, the ability to plan and predict. I think we are very young in the in this new world. We found ourselves having to transform the business going from a customer site facing organization to a completely remote one in 24 hours has, has challenged us in a, a number of positive ways. And I can imagine that size and scale of many businesses are going to be feeling those ripples for a long time. So obvious things around workforce engagement, the ability for them to be productive, engage with their colleagues, maintain security and compliance as they're accessing the company data from any remote location. Some of those challenges were very reactively solved and you had to have security and compliance step back a little bit in order for the business to survive and manage that change, well, those roles have to be there and that they have to come back in. And actually, many of the things that were reactively done are now being reviewed again now. Are they sustainable? Are they robust enough? Is this the time to change and put something in now that we've settled down to a a more natural state, I suppose? And so we see a lot of that thinking. We see a lot of what came out as compelling change. So for example, we do quite a bit of work in universities and higher education. One of the big challenges that, that they faced was students couldn't get on campus. Were they getting the benefit of the investment they were making within that university? And actually, the universities have seen that as a reverse and flipped it around and said, actually, well, we can have boundaryless education now if we improve the way that our digital platforms support and engage and nurture our our students. And so you're actually seeing growth and opportunity come from all of this change. And we're still processing and seeing how some of those are rippling out across the market. Yeah, I think we see that in the medical field too, as it accelerated remote appointments, remote viewing, and a lot of people were wondering whether that was here to stay. And I think that is also here to stay. And people are also flipping it around and using it as a way to get more care to more people in a more cost-effective way. So it is transforming and driving. But we have entered that more steady state. I think you mentioned customers are going back and revisiting Do we need to step up and and revisit the compliance, the protocols, the policies? Because a lot of things were done quickly. I've heard that topic from another folks as well. I wanted to turn now to a study that Extrovert and VMware did together earlier, March, earlier this year. We commissioned with you a Forrester study, and it found that 97% of decision makers reported companies struggling when adopting cloud. And we've talked a little bit about that, the complexity. And it found that 74% of organizations were not working with managed service providers at that time. 
but planning to invest with one within the next year. And we've talked a little bit about some of the drivers there. Can you tell us, first of all, why you were interested in doing this study? What were some of the other insights that really stood out to you? And how the some of the challenges that customers face with cloud adoption that you believe Extrovert is really, if we haven't covered it, really positioned to be able to help? Well, this was fascinating because we have market insights and we've got customer feedback. But we were really surprised at the desire to work with managed service providers, which really highlighted the scale of the problem to us. The reason we did it was that we wanted to validate those insights, but across a broader enterprise range of decision makers and getting to those en masse in in a short time frame is exactly what Forrester's geared to do. The challenges that we saw and, and that we solve were really spotlighted for us. This came from this recognition that is we had to stay relevant. We saw problems, customers came to us. We said, oh, we can't be a a project organization anymore because that's not really the whole story and it's not really the value chain that's going to be relevant to the future. So we set about solving that problem. What came back to us was that a resounding challenge where customers are finding that program gap, as we call it, where traditionally a, a partner would come in, help achieve that change, exit, say goodbye, hope everything goes well for you, left this this huge knowledge gap because the support of the ongoing platforms was, was a lot more complex than it used to be. We saw these challenges with key person dependency risks and governance exposure and customers who didn't necessarily fully appreciate the change in, in the operating model. And so this was a great validator for us to, to, to come back and, and recalibrate the way that we engage with customers. So rather than talking about it at the end of a project going, have you got the right skills? Have you got the right capabilities? Are you comfortable? Have you got the knowledge? Is, is this going to be okay? We start that at the beginning now. So we go, things are going to change. Let's really dive into what your target operating model is going to look like. Let let us try and explain and articulate what you're going to have and the powerful engines that you've got and how to get the most from it. Let's maybe do a skills analysis up front and let's maybe predict if we put something like early life support in at the end, we're mitigating a risk at the beginning of the project, not at the end of the project. And actually that's taken off amazingly. Customers have been hugely receptive to that. And again, coming back to the survey, it was addressing a real need that most CIOs and CTOs are facing today. I think across the board, we're seeing those trends as cloud is that driver with a number of the topics that we've talked about today. One of the other trends along with managed services that we're seeing is customers shift to everything is a subscription, everything kind of is SaaS, right? Customers, whether it's due to skills shortage, managing complexity, I think there's a shift of it's less about the technology in and of itself. It comes back to what you started with was saying when you're focused on helping to deliver outcomes. Customers more and more these days are focused on delivering those outcomes. From people I've talked to, that seems to be a driver that's fueling this wanting to stream everything. Are you seeing that same trend with the customers that you work with? Are you seeing that being the motivation for the shift? And how much of your customers do you believe are going to shift more to a SaaS and subscription way of consuming? And what does it mean for extrovert? I think dynamic choice and consumption based on the landscape that we have in front of us, that uncertainty factor is playing a big role, really amplified the last two years in terms of cloud adoption, needing to move fast, seeing the post-pandemic challenges around chip shortages and balanced supply demand means that decisions cannot be delayed by the supply chain issues. Knowing what you need and when you need it is, is become increasingly more challenging. So though there is always going to be a place for reserved capacity, I suspect, the ability to be more agile and dynamic really suits where we are today. And I see that in terms of the way that it impacts extrovert, but hopefully in a a positive way. When a customer comes to us and says, we have a problem, one of the biggest challenges is finding out whether it's a technology gap problem or an operating model problem, and the the solution will be different. It might be consultancy, it might be supporting over a, a particular complex problem, or it might be actually supporting a gap within the operating model. And I'm sure the problem is never what the customer actually says it is when they come to you. (laughs) And the first is figuring out and validating what is the real problem. So I had a bank come to us. They said, we have a problem. Something's on fire. Something's broken. Can you come and fix it? And when we come and we scratch the surface and, and actually the problem wasn't the fact that they had a problem. The problem was the root cause, which was actually because of the stability of the platforms, they'd forgotten the art of troubleshooting. 
And so actually what they ended up doing was making these little, what they thought were innocuous changes. And those innocuous changes built up and built up and built and suddenly the whole thing fell down and they said, oh, we have a problem. But they weren't sure what the problem was or how to articulate it. And so for us to sort of come in and start peeling all those layers back was a real eye opener to them. It was at that point they said, actually, our knowledge is more geared to core business applications and business context. That's where we add value in, in IT. We don't necessarily add value as much as we thought we did anymore. And therefore, perhaps this is something that is more beneficial for, for extrovert to come in and maybe support us. And it was, became a journey of discovery for both of us because we were going, OK, well, what is it? Where are you at? Where do you actually need to go as a business? And then perhaps we can start supporting you in the right ways. And that doesn't mean trying to take the entire problem away. It's it's understanding where choice, ownership, where do they want to be as a business? What do they want to own today versus what they want to own tomorrow? And that's very much the, the common challenge or the conversations that we have today. Stability paradox, everything is going great until it's not. When it's not, it's not necessarily the thing you think it was. I think it sounds like extrovert sometimes is more of an IT therapist for your companies than anything else. We started off the conversation talking about extroverts focused on outcomes, and that's come up a couple of other times. And question for you around customers' ability or thinking around outcomes. As I've been in this business for a long time, I know you've been in this business a long time, and one of the things that I've seen is as we've worked with customers at trying to understand how to be able to tell their stories, and, and usually it's stories with how they benefited from VMware technology, one of the challenges that we've had over the years is trying to actually get them to be able to articulate the end result in terms of a business outcome. They're great about saying, here's how we deployed it, here's how we spec'd it, here are the changes that we made, how it worked, and kind of some speeds and feeds. But as we've tried to say, but great, but what is the business outcome you've been able to realize? Sometimes that's been hard. How have you been able to work with customers to get them to focus on thinking about the outcomes from the outset even, let alone realizing what they achieved? It's an amazing question. And we have a a long tale of legacy about how we used to operate things and the relationship that IT had or didn't have with the business. And I I think this is fascinating. And and I do think it is a, a real psychological insight to the way that businesses and business culture works. We tried to work with it in the beginning. We tried to work with the IT teams and we tried to find the gaps and bridge them. And that's super hard to do. What we ended up doing was was actually something that was very much a, a, a process thing. We are all about customer success. So it's very much we have a matrix of understanding customer success across the business as the customer engagement with us moves from early engagement, scoping, trust building through to change and and operations. We try never to lose sight of the fact that ownership is, is shared, but someone has to lead at each point of the way. And the way that we deal with that particular challenge of communication outcomes and setting of that is actually we try and achieve that up front. It's not always possible because the mindset's not necessarily there and it takes a little while for our engagement approach to, to sort of sink through and be recognized. But what we do is in project management, we have a project management standard time task milestone, which keeps us on track. We need to be delivering. We need to be able to articulate that back and align with all the other moving parts in the business. But what we also do is we have delivery management capabilities, which is much more aligned to customer outcome success. And that delivery management works with both the the project management teams, the customer and the business outcomes. And they actually measure in line with the project. So if they say, okay, we've delivered this part of the the project today, delivery management will be looking at which part of the business outcome did we deliver Mm -hmm. today? Because customers are saying, I don't want to do 18 months worth of high risk, long term transformation. I don't know what's going to be like in that time. I want to get outcome prototyping. I want early production. I want early business engagement within the first six months, if not earlier. So we have to recalibrate the time task versus the business outcome and actually really align to that. That's been massively helpful, not only for us to be able to understand customer success and how we think about the business success, but also helps the customer know that we're coming at it with hopefully their best intentions at at heart and how we're trying to align. What you find is that actually the story builds itself. So when you get to the end of it, actually the case study is all pretty much written for them and for us, and it makes it much easier for them to talk about success within their businesses as much as we can showcase it to others. Interesting. It, I know a lot of companies and VMware is looking at this as well, are adopting OKRs as a framework to be able to help measure progress and be clearly to set goals. It almost sounds like adopting that kind of mentality with your customers 
for this sprint? What are the short-term outcomes? How we're going to measure success for this milestone? And it serves both to mutually know, have you achieved what you want, but also be able to show the value of what you're delivering. And it really is a different shift and a different approach in working with customers. It is. And sometimes it flushes out the disconnects. It's one thing to say that you're investing in an outcome and it's another thing to break that down and all the little moving parts along the way. And you've got an outcome, but you've got a capability. You suddenly start seeing those disconnects appearing. It's quite a good way of breaking down a project and trying to catch those disconnects as you go rather than have big surprises at the end. That's great. I think you need to write a white paper on that type of methodology, although it might be giving away extrovert secrets and we certainly don't want to do that. I want to turn now, Gavin, to your career and how you wound up where you are, because you've had a particularly, from my perspective, interesting career journey. You did not start as a technologist. From what I understand, you actually, I think, started in the the legal field first. You started in the legal field in New Zealand, and you are the founder and CEO of a very successful global cloud consulting firm based in the UK. Help me understand how you got from A to B, because that's not a typical journey, Gavin. I can't understand it. Sometimes people say that you're products of your parents. And my dad's English. He's very much the old English craftsman. Everything had an edge of quality and preparedness and working towards something great. And my mum's South African and completely opposite. She would describe herself mad and totally extroverted. And I think I probably ended up with a bit of a healthy mix of this energy to create, do it well, not chaotic creation. So actually, the path I took was all about creating value. I made driftwood furniture for a couple of years. I went down to the beach and I I crafted something and I'd created a a go-to-market on that in our local market, did a bit of a marketing firm. It was this need to find somewhere where I could deploy that energy. And uh, coming over here for a short trip in 2000, I had to make some pretty key choices in terms of transferable skills. We actually obviously ended up staying a lot longer, but IT was my, my first love. I started with a Sinclair ZX81 and 16K memory pack, and all you could do was, was program and code. I actually rekindled that love of IT and technology. I love it when there's a gap. Extrovert Mark One was born in 2007. Actually, VMware was making this huge sea change in the market, enabling business to revolutionize the data center. It was a bit of a no-brainer. There was so much going on, but there was such a vacuum of uh, information. So I actually grabbed a couple of friends and we wrote hundreds and hundreds of articles and white papers and templates. And we we wrote a bunch of software. We wrote a backup program. We wrote a prototypical virtual storage device, which was a very, very basic version of what vSAN is today. And we just shared it. There were no blogs around at the time. Uh, and literally, I was I was amazed at the the response. Uh, we had something like quarter of a million followers in twelve months, and we had built up this this huge following and thousands of downloads. Um, that actually led to to the sale of those assets, and we we came out in the middle of the um, the financial crisis with all these market insights about what what gaps were. And it was actually at that point where organizations were coming to us and saying things like, well, you seem to know what you're talking about. Can you help us on this journey? And we we recognized that cloud and digital transformation were very much of their their infancy. But we used that as a building block to be able to understand where problems were and solve a different set of problems as we move forward. So one of the best best moves I ever made was keep my extrovert brand after we, we sold off in the first time. I love that. I was curious, and you made the connection for you, how we were getting from a trained in the legal profession, manufacturing driftwood furniture, neither of which I think of as high tech professions or strong connections to technology to running a very in the the eye of the tornado technology firm. And it sounds like self-driven out of the craftsman love of coding and learning. Part of the, the psychology of the extrovert is having people who are driven and passionate about technology and solving problems. And I see myself as a bit of an air traffic controller, I suppose. We've got such huge talents and depth, and I'm constantly amazed over the capability of our teams. What I want to instill is a culture of transparency and passion and customers seeing us going the extra mile as the exception to the rule. For what is actually a pretty heavily distributed organization and always has been communication, communication, communication. 
if we can communicate our value proposition, our path, our strategy, our value to our people, then our people will share that with our customers. And you know, hopefully then our customers become not only customers for the project, but customers for life. I try and keep us on that path. Well, so let's talk about how you've been able to keep your company on that path over now what is almost two years of not just disruption for your customers. I mean, you mentioned that Extrovert had to go from being a, I want to say on-premise, people physically on-premise visiting customers to virtual delivery overnight. How have you been challenged as a leader of this company, as the heart and soul of driving Extrovert and its culture? How have the the last almost two years challenged you? How has it shaped you? And, And maybe how are you leading Extrovert differently now than you were a year and a half ago? I can almost remember the day that it happened as well. And actually that communication baseline served us really, really well. So we were communicating, we were working through at really high pace, how to keep customers moving and adjusting and adapting whilst we had to effectively create a new rock for ourselves. You know, everyone's personal lives were in turmoil without a plan, without a framework to achieve our own change. I think it would have been a lot harder. We implemented a framework called 4R framework, and there are lots of these around the world. You know, ours is reaction, resilience, recovery, and, and new reality. What it allowed us to do was communicate to our business that we recognized that there was immediate change. We had to practice and prove it because we weren't going to get it right first time. And then we would set ourselves on the path to iterating and become masters of a new reality. It enabled people to understand that the business recognized that we were on a new journey. And actually, we took that opportunity because we were changing everything to actually think about the way to engage as a company. We wanted to engage our customers in a different way. We wanted to add value in different ways. And to be able to measure it as well and go, we lit up the first box, this is where we are today. And then a month or two later, these are the things that we've all done. We've all now moved into the resilience phase. And it gave people the sense of progression and understanding that we were making deliberate steps forward. And actually what came out of it was a new empowerment. We learned a lot more about our business. People like challenges. People don't want to sort of feed all their challenges up. If you say, look, we're changing. We all need to be part of this change here we go, we're going to go into it and we empower everybody to be part of that change. Actually, you get a lot better engagement. You you see the the pride people take in not delivering a task, but to own an outcome. And we try and practice what we try and achieve in our customers. That was really eye-opening that we could not only survive, but but actually thrive off the back of what could be a big challenge to to the business. Well, it does seem as if you have taken to heart the same trend that you shared your customers are going through, which is learning how to use this period of disruption and change as an opportunity to pivot and grow. And you've certainly led by example as you've used that same approach with Extrovert. I'm writing down and taking notes because I think your guidance is important for any company that is going through massive change. I know at VMware, we're going through, like every other company, massive transformation as we evolve our business to respond to the demand for SaaS and subscription from our customers as we pivot to adopt and support all the clouds that are out there. And I think those are some really, really good notes that VMware leaders can learn from as well. So Gavin, let's wrap up today with a couple of fun lightning round questions. Assuming you're not traveling as much and you have time to read and listen and have some little downtime, what are you most enjoying reading or listening to these days? Okay, so I've actually just finished a book called Play Bigger by Al Ramadan and and a couple of other authors. This one really stood out to me because it's an interesting different perspective about winning in business, not by being better, but by being different. But I love the fact that they recognize that markets evolve fast and sometimes you've got to stop and see whether actually you're in a different category to the one that you thought you were. And if you are in a different category or new category, actually you get to be the master of that category. You can write the rules for that. It's about how to change the lens of follower to leader. I thought that was fantastic. So that's my favorite read of of recent times. Oh, that's great. I'm going to add it to my ongoing book list that I get from all of my guests because I've gotten some great suggestions and that sounds like a really good one for us to read and actually a lot of the listeners because I think a lot of us are finding all of a sudden we're in a different market category as things are shifting around us. Who is someone that inspires you on a daily basis, whether personally or professionally and why? That one's probably more to my sort of New Zealand grassroots Growing up in in the great outdoors, Sir Edmund Hillary was kind of key in my growth. 
he's the, the first mountaineer to reach the summit of Everest with, with Tenzing Norgay. And, and that's always stood out to me. He was a real icon of that pioneering spirit, really not seeing boundaries, but stepping out and exploring the uncharted. Again, a very driven person, being comfortable that in many cases you know, stepping into the unknown. And I really like that. It really sings to what we've tried to do with, with Extrovert and Evolve and, and still stay relevant, but know that the market is always entering new un- uncharted waters. So it, Sir Edmund Hillary's is, is one of my favorites. I love that. I love that visual image of stepping out into the unknown, also under adverse conditions, which are particularly challenging. I love, I love that example. And lastly, Gavin, what excites you most about the technology industry and its promise for the future, its promise for your customers? Unending opportunity for both customers to adapt and keep adapting and our unending opportunity to support them. We go through these sort of blue sky, where are things going? Where do we need to think about R&D? And there really are so many opportunities for, for businesses to really make a substantial difference and change if they have the, the strength and the heart and the leadership to follow through. And f- for me, we're always changing. We're always reinventing ourselves. We're always trying to stay relevant. And I love that. I think that ongoing evolution of change is, is what keeps us passionate and involved as, as much as we were 14 years ago. That's great. Well, Gavin, it's just been a pleasure to speak with you today to hear about the four R's that guided extroverts transformation or evolution over the last couple of years, your passion for supporting your customers change transformations and delivering outcomes, and your constant desire to step into the unknown following the steps of but maybe in a little less snowy environment than Sir Edmund Hillary as you continue to deliver cut value for your customers every day. Thank you, Kathleen. It's been a real pleasure to be part of this today. And I love talking with you guys. I love your genuine authenticity to serve the market better and to solve those challenges as much as we do. So it's a real pleasure. Well, thanks, Gavin. And it's great, as always, to be working with partners like you who are on the front lines working with our customers every day. What a great conversation with Gavin. It was really interesting to hear extroverts' insight and research on some of the common challenges customers face with cloud adoption and how extroverts' managed services are specifically designed to fill those gaps. I also enjoyed learning about extroverts' culture of transparency and passion and what it really means to be a customer-first organization focused on adding value at every step of a customer's life cycle. I hope you enjoyed this insightful conversation too. To learn more about VMware, please visit vmware.com. To connect with Gavin, you can find him on LinkedIn or on Twitter at Gavin Jolliffe. Thank you for joining me on this episode today. Please remember to subscribe, follow, and review VMware Partnership Perspectives podcast from your streaming platform of choice. For more information on VMware's partner programs, please visit partnerexecutiveedge at vmware.com. I'm Kathleen Tandy. Thank you for listening and see you next time.